and welcome everyone, whichever curve of the globe, whichever country, whichever time zone, whichever households, whichever corner of the room, and whichever information technology device you're using. Welcome to this little nexus of the information superhighway where we'll be coalescing together for a little while. And um, I'm here just briefly to not to steal the thunder of our speakers, but just to explain a little bit about why this event might be of interest to us. Um, Perspectiva, we describe ourselves as a community of expert generalists. And it's a little bit of a status claim because who's to say if we're really experts, but we're aspiring to be people who get better at seeing things as a whole, looking at the global predicament and how it relates to the inner life of human beings. And in order to do that, you have to be quite fluid with your ways of knowing and your ways of acting which is why our team is quite diverse and has a lot of different sort of qualities of uh, inquiry about us. The issues of the day though are really very pressing. And um, I worked on climate change for many years when I was working at the Royal Society of Arts in London. And the more I looked into it, the more uh, troubled I felt by just how difficult it was to even fail well at this point. Um, and, you know, it, we really are quite deeply into that predicament and we will struggle even with the best will in the world, the greatest amounts of cooperation. Um, a great deal has already happened and is already underway that cannot be undone. Um, and equally through our personal lives, we, we face different uh, you know, tragedies in our life. And as we get a little bit older, we see a little bit more of the dark side sometimes. And so the interest in the post-tragic is really about, you know, how should one feel in this phase of time? Um, we'd like to remain positive, you know, we'd like to enjoy our lives and to keep that kind of energy that we're encouraged to have that believes we can live good lives, help each other, um, have, you know, meaningful time on earth while also addressing the issues of the day. But we also want to keep it real. So my interest in the post-tragic is something about the, the, ne the juxtaposition of those two words. Some hear those two words and they hear one or the other of them. Some will hear the tragic and go, oh no, not that. Others will hear the post and want to know what's on the other side. But in some ways, for me, the intrigue is really the relationship. It's the fact that they're, they're co-presence, you know, recognizing the tragedy, but somehow living with it and yet beyond it too. So tonight is really a chance to look more deeply at what that means. And I'm delighted to welcome Marion and Zach um, to join us. And I'll pass back to Pippa just to um, move things along. Thank you very much and enjoy. Thanks, Jonathan. That's wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful introduction to why we're here. And now I'm going to pass over to Mark Vernon, who uh, who, who I've been working with to put this uh, event together. And it was his suggestion that we that we bring Marion into this conversation. And so he'll he'll introduce her uh, to you all. Thanks, Pippa. Yeah, Marion immediately actually came to my mind when we were planning uh, tonight's event. Um, we met a while ago now. And I would recommend her book to you very strongly indeed, actually, um, if you sit very still. Um, she's someone who's done a tremendous amount of this really soul work, I think, that we're calling by this phrase, the post-tragic, the post-tragic state of mind. And as Pippa mentioned already, um, it began when her sister Lucy suddenly disappeared in 1994. And for 21 years, no one knew what had happened to Lucy until her remains were found in the basement of the house belonging to the serial killers Fred and Rosemary West. And it turned out that they were responsible for the deaths of many people, including Lucy. So for three decades, Marion has been reclaiming Lucy and her own life in a deep and at times fierce search for a human soulful response to a brutal tragedy. And she draws on a number of practices, dreams, as well as a lot of public work. And there's a tremendous amount that she could share with us this evening. But Marion, let me hand over to you now to speak to us about these things. Good evening, everyone. It's lovely to be with you. 
Um, I brought a friend with me this evening um, who I'd like to introduce you to. This is the owl who comes from Vancouver Island and he was, I, he used to be a, um, a branch of a uh, cedar tree. And when I was on the island for three months doing some research into um, how indigenous people um, respond for the healing practices that they have in relation to their traumatic loss, which is huge. Um, I, I, at the end of my stay, I, I'm, I met a man called Laverne Sampson, who's, who's um, an indigenous man from um, a reserve called Sarklip, north of Victoria. And, um, and he, I was introduced to him as a carver. And um, he told me something of his story of, of, why, of why he became a carver. And I feel that this, I, I like the fact that this owl is with us tonight because he actually, in some cultures, represents the death of the old order. And its call warns you that you must be prepared to adapt to a new way of thinking, to accept the loss of the old and familiar. <clears throat> it can also represent the ability to see clearly the seer through the darkness of chaos, confusion and deception, and the need for self-examination. The owl is confronting and enables self-transformation and realization, bringing the dark wisdom of the subconscious into the light. It can also be a harbinger of death. So when I met Laverne, I, I commissioned a, a talking piece for our, the project I've been involved with for since 2004, the Forgiveness Project, which uses stories to explore forgiveness um, in prisons and in the community. And it's, it doesn't have a particular religious um, focus, but it has a collection of people who speak from the place of having either experienced traumatic loss or perpetrated poor traumatic loss and have found a way that brings something fresh and meaningful to the experience of loss. And through the sharing of stories, it helps other to tell others to tell their stories. So this stick, when I expected it to be about that big, and when it came, it turned out to be a full-size staff. And when you stand with it, it gives you a sense of empowerment and it's used in their culture in a way that if, you, if you're holding the talking piece, you, you speak and it helps you to speak with uh, gravitas and respect. And it's very much about when the person's holding the stick, no one else speaks. So it's a, an exercise in listening deeply too. And we've used it in our project in restorative circles in the community, but we couldn't take it into the prisons because it was seen as a weapon, sadly. <laughs> um, so I'd like to just bring Laverne's words into this. He said his son, Shane, committed suicide in 1997. And there's a huge problem with many destructive ways on, on the reserves relating back to the attempted cultural genocide of the, um, the white settlers 150 years ago. Um, he says, I like to work with driftwood because it's already seasoned. The constant waves are there to wash everything away. The wood itself lets me know when it is ready to carve. I work around splits and cracks. I'm looking at the grain of the wood. Creating the talking stick was fun. It took so long because it's not fun every day. I only worked on it if I was feeling good. I put medicine of forgiveness into it. Before I sent it off, I gave it a blessing and smudged it, a mixture of herbs, buffalo, sage, sweet grass. When my son died in 1997, I didn't know who to talk to. I did things by myself, found my own answers. It came about for a good thing. I look for that lost piece of wood that's straining to be more <clears throat> than a, float, a lost floater in the ocean. 
I'm very selective. I can go for a week every day along the beaches and not bring back a single piece. Every piece lets me know that's the one. I create something out of it so that people can see it. It's beautiful. It's 20 years since Shane died. It adds up. So my story spans a longer period than that. It started in 1973 when my sister and Lucy and I were home for the Christmas holidays. We were both studying English literature at university. And, um, and we shared a love of T.S. Eliot and we used to muse on the phrase, the intersection of time with eternity. And I feel that there's something very much about how we see time in this question of the post-tragic. Lucy had chosen to become a Catholic five weeks before she came home for Christmas. And we all went out to visit friends two days after Christmas and Lucy didn't come home. That was the last time we saw her. There began the long time of what I call the not knowing. But at the beginning of of this period, um, I had, I've had three significant dreams and in a way they've been the most guiding, deeply guiding aspect of my experience. And the first dream um, is, feels felt at the time deeply significant and real. And it's been really like the core of my spiritual practice. At the time, um, in the dream, Lucy came back and I asked her, I said, where have you been? And she said, I've been sitting in a water meadow near Grantham. And then she said the words, if you sit very still, you can hear the sun move. And in the dream, I felt what I describe as the peace that passeth understanding. And it was a place where everything was joined up, where there was, there was absolute harmony where in that state, one would only want others to know that place. And it felt like a place that could hold something of the mystery and the pain of the not knowing, the years of not knowing. But during that time, so in a way, it, that period began with a huge loss that was, wasn't resolved for 20 years. And, um, and my response at the time, I was 25 and Lucy was 21, was to make some very destructive choices um, which hurt other people and which I've had to face in my life when we found out what happened. But all this time under the current, I had, um, I had three children. I have a good, lovely relationship with Nick, who I'm still with. I had a very difficult relationship with two of the children, his father. Um, and, but the whole of that, it, that time, I remember feeling very isolated. It was as if, as if nobody really knew how to relate to me. And, in a way, you lose your parents when something like that happens. You know, they're not there for you anymore. And, my, and our parents were divorced, so it was already a complicated family. Um, and so the other time, so I call that dream the shining silence. It felt like they, they, it, to speak any words would destroy the wholeness of it and the beauty of it and the meaning of it. It was just humbling and I, I kind of felt I knew where I was in the world. And I often mused about the meaning of, of the words. Um, but the other aspect of the experience of the 20 years of not knowing was what I call the frozen silence. And that was um, very much about there not being any words because they could nothing could be spoken in a way and in our family um it was almost taboo to speak of lucy as the years went by and yet there was this increasing fear that we'd all die and never know what had happened to her so 
I write stuck as a fly in amber, no one speaks, gagged into masked conformity. The pain no one speaks about because there are no words or because the words will crack open the pain. The words would express the pain, share the pain, but it is taboo. If we don't say it, it might not be true. Life goes on, but only life that pretends, hides in the silence, that magnifies the pain. The taboo is against the pain of being alive. As Joseph Campbell said, love is the pain of being alive. We went crooked, deformed by the secret of a missing sister. How do you grow straight when you wait with your secret, wait to know? The first year of not knowing was full of crookedness, a void, avoidance, a void dance, hopping on one leg. In 1994, we began to find out what had happened to Lucy. And I was work, I remember working seeing some newspapers at work and beginning to immediately our family began to think that it might be something to lose about Lucy when bodies were beginning to be dug up at 25 Cromwell Street in Gloucester and I remember I went to see my mum and and the police had said no that's not nothing to do with Lucy we'll let you know if, if we've got any news for you. So I went to see my mum who still lived in Cheltenham and, and the next day um, the police came and told us that they said they had some news for us and they told us that Lucy was one of the victims of Fred and Rosemary West and that she was buried in the basement. And um, by this time they hadn't begun to dug up the basement, but I remember, I, me, I remember making a vow at the time, I just felt, and I don't usually make vows, but I think making a vow is sometimes helpful, it's like a very strong intention, and, and I, I just felt that, that um, I needed to try and bring something good out of this, something that we could all learn from, but I didn't know what it was. And then I had the second dream, which was about wanting to know what was left of Lucy. And in the dream, um, I was shown a bag of bones with numbers on them and it, they assembled to become a full size skeleton. And I wanted to put my arms around the skeleton and it became Lucy in flesh. And I remembered what she was like to hold. And so I woke up and thought, I, I need to go and do something about this. And at the time, the bones were kept for another year. They were called an exhibit for the defence. They were caught up in the criminal investigation. So I did go with two friends and um, took special objects with me. And, and we were shown into a, um, a chapel of rest and there was a full-size coffin there. And, um, and we were expected to just sit there and go away. And I just said, no, I've got something I've, I need to do. Um, I've brought some things I want to put in with Lucy's bones. And, I, it, and fortunately the man understood. And so that was when he unscrewed the lid of the coffin and there were two boxes inside. And I pointed at the smaller box and I said, is her skull in there? And he nodded and I moved forward and I it was I, I could only say that I that this was the space that Lucy and I had mused about it was the place where time and eternity were inter intersecting and I knew what to do and there was no fear in the experience and it was if it felt as if I was doing it for for all women who'd been abused and treated horrendously by mostly men um, in this case not this not quite true and um, but I saw her skull and it, and it just suddenly it looked like burnished gold it looked beautiful and I felt the urge to pick her skull up and kiss her brow 
and I laid it back with a piece of sheep's wool and heather that I'd got from the nearby mountain and it felt as if I was just reclaiming Lucy from the wretched hole she'd been buried in for so long and bringing some beauty and love into the situation. Um, and so the first year was really about laying Lucy to rest. And we had a beautiful funeral eventually for her. And, um, and on that occasion, there were three priests came and the sun came out and my husband made this little box out of oak wood to fit the bones. And I went back and laid them carefully and put special objects in again including a, a book of her poems that she'd written that my mum had, they had been gathering together and self-published when, um, before we found out and it felt as if we were all getting ready to know. So after the, um, after the funeral, we could have, eventually have a funeral, but only because Frederick West committed suicide and that meant that, that that his that Lucy's bones were no longer needed as an exhibit for the defence. So sh very shortly after doing that, I, I, I started to go on Buddhist retreats um, in a nearby place up on the mountainside with where there's no electricity, and and I'd wondered whether to go, and then the, the teacher had said. Um, this is exactly the time to come. So I, I began to learn about, I, I'd come across Buddhism, but I began to sit on intensive retreats over the years. And this was how I lived through what I call the thaw, the, the moving from the frozen silence to the shining silence and, and the thaw of the healing of getting to the depth of the grief and I made a vow on one retreat to try and forgive the people who killed Lucy because that had felt the only creative, imaginative way forward. The other ways of dealing with the unresolved pain were either denial, letting it eat me away, the end result could be suicide, dumping it on others, that would be, mur the end result could be murder. So it was like how to, deal with this pain in a way that was going to be not perpetuating the cycle of violence, that was going to actually move towards a place of healing. So eventually I, I was on a retreat and I, I, um, I was feeling the, the feeling that um, Mark put on the blurb about this event, that feeling of, of, of just no energy and being stuck. And I, I spoke to the charm master and he just said the words, just know that your suffering is helping to relieve the suffering of others. And I didn't really know what he meant, but I went back and sat on the cushion and I thought of Rosemary West and, and and a very half-heartedly said, well, I hope this pain is going to help you in some way. And then I had the most extraordinary insight of, of my whole body waking up and suddenly knowing something of her suffering, knowing her isolation, knowing that she's hated by our culture, knowing that, um, that her shame, and, and I just, very connected with that and the amazing thing that happened was that once I did that it was as if my deepest shame came to the surface and, and I and that left too and so I was left with this release this feeling of having faced my I'd faced my own murderous rage I'd faced my rotting piles of mistakes and I'd got to this place where I knew myself, so I knew her in a way, even, and, and, I, and it just felt freeing. And after that, it, so the inner journey then turned into an outer journey and I was invited to go to an international conference on forgiveness. And then I was invited to go to an international conference on restorative justice. So that was when 
I began to, and I was invited to work in prisons. So I began to go into prisons. And I forgot to say that the five weeks before we found out what happened to Lucy, I'd chosen to become a Quaker, having attended Quaker meetings. So shared silence with, with fellow asp aspirants, with people with se a sense of wanting to get to some sort of truth in life this was an important part of my my healing to be able to just sit and allow the thaw and allow love I felt that I was allowing love and I was finding compassion for myself so by the time I started to work in prisons I felt that this restorative justice was the exact shape of the inner journey in a way and so people sit, we sit in circles and with the forgiveness project in 2004, I started doing more prison work. And this owl, this, this form of listening, this thought form of speaking in a circle is actually at the roots of restorative justice. It's actually about seeing crime as harm done that needs healing and needing to listen to each person who's been affected. So, and, and in a way, taking off the labels. So when I work in prisons, I always say, we're in here together. I'm not a victim, you're not a perpetrator. And I've investigated my own life as a perpetrator, a victim and a bystander. I know those parts of myself. And there's something about sharing this story that helps people to get in touch with their story and, and share their story. So some extraordinary things have happened in prisons. And I felt the challenge from a Quaker perspective was how could you, how could I find that of God in people who've committed atrocious crimes? And the more people I met in prison, the more I knew that everyone did have that of God in them and that that they that approaching people in that way meant that they could express that in some way so eventually I, I sent a letter to Rosemary West and I, I wanted her to know the effect on me of what had happened and the fact and I ended the letter with with a reference to the I call I said I offer you the springing of the brants um which was an experience I'd had on a, the last retreat I'd been on where it had snowed and snowed and the weight of the tree branches had been pushed down and I just brushed past and the snow fell off a branch and sprang back to where it was meant to be. And I said, I, I feel no ill will to you at all. Um, I just feel deeply sad that this has happened. And I, I want you to know that our lives are connected and I send you the springing of the branch. So I'll end with Lucy's words. Lucy wrote poetry and she loved words. And the most difficult thing for me about her death was that she was gagged so she couldn't use her voice. She couldn't speak. Her beauty was masked and denied and she became a, an object of torture and rape and murder. And oh. so I always say this poem at the end of any work I do with Lucy, and I feel that the beauty of her life, it, I, I've reclaimed in some way and offered it in a way that, that the story can grow and the conversation can grow. And when the book was published, it went further. And the words are so simple they, they're in great they're on her gravestone and she she wrote things are as big as you make them I can fill a whole body a whole day of life with worry about a few words on one scrap of paper and yet the same evening looking up can frame my fingers to fit the sky in my cupped hands Thank you so much, Marion. Thank you for sharing your story with us and bringing Lucy here with us as well. Really appreciate that. Are we just going to take a, 
a few moments just to let that that land that weight of Marion's words so just take a moment to reflect on what's been said Okay, so that was a very personal story. And again, thank you for sharing your experience and particularly the story of the inner coming to the outer and this reflection of your journey with these prisoners that you met and worked with. And now I'd like to introduce Zach Stein, who actually brought the term post-tragic to Perspective's attention. Um, Zach has written two books uh, social justice and educational measurement and education in a time between worlds. Uh, he's a philosopher, a writer and futurist and we're really pleased that he's able to dial in from Vermont for this event. So Zach if you'd like to expand this evening from what we've already heard. Thank you um, and thank you uh, Mariana that was um, very powerful and it's hard to know what to say into the space after that and I intentionally didn't really prepare anything because I knew that <laughs> it would be almost impossible to to know what would be appropriate to say and and you know I I had glanced at your story and absorbed a video that was sent to me where you spoke before <clears throat> um, but I have not read your book and so I didn't know the details uh, and strange synchronicity occurred today because before I got on this call, I thought, well, where did I actually encounter the post-tragic consciousness first, like in my own life? And it was actually with uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And he was a post-tragic figure. He, his first wife, who he met when he was very young, his great, the great love of his life died very tragically. And the, the image in my mind of the post-tragic is actually Emerson late at night breaking in and opening the coffin and we're looking at his dead wife's body to be in touch with that reality. And so I was gonna share that image actually, I before you even mentioned <laughs> that a similar thing had occurred. And, and so there are these images that I wanna surface uh, from what you said, and that's one of them, right? the skeleton, the hugging of the skeleton, right? That's a post-tragic image. <laughs> uh, and in, in my metapsychology for people who care, you know, the, the, the pre-tragic, tragic, post-tragic post is in this domain of ensoulment. It is exactly soul work, Mark. And uh, the process of ensoulment involves images and the transformation of images and the emergence of images. And you offered so many profound post-tragic images, right? So the image of the broken driftwood in the vast ocean put on a random shore, picked from obscurity and turned into something incredibly beautiful, right? This is a, a post-tragic image. The skull, the shining, beautiful skull, right? That's an, this is another post-tragic image. Um, the owl, of Minerva, right? The owl of Athena, the owl of wisdom uh, is this sign like <laughs> mirroring the sign in the Bible that knowledge itself comes in a tragic structure, right? Uh, beautiful image. Um, and uh, the snow on the bow of the pine tree, um, you know, that notion of the resiliency of nature, even under the weight of the death of the winter, right? So again, just the, the whole, <laughs> the whole time you spoke, it was full. And then of course, the, the, the most striking one, which 
resonates with my experience, this move from the frozen silence to the shining silence, right? I mean, that's one way of describing the move from the tragic to the post-tragic. Uh, and, uh, you know, the move from the pre-tragic to the tragic is also complex <laughs> and involves imagery. Um, but my sense is people drawn to a talk like this have most of us <laughs> begun to make that move out of the pre-tragic uh, into the tragic and the question of how to get through to the other side of the tragic, how to move from the frozen silence into the shining silence. This is one of the questions like of our time. It's one of the questions history is basically asking us to, to be able to answer as, as people. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I was just struck by the resonance of the imagery and specifically the the dream work nature of what your inner process was like, um, you know, which is again in the domain of insolment. This is how it takes place in my experience. Um, uh, has shown this to be the, the case as well. That in fact, um, you know, when you look at certain aspects of, so I'm a psychologist. <laughs> so I look at this often as a psychologist. And so you're looking at certain ways that human development works. How do people actually process trauma and profound tragedy? And what are the things that allow for post-traumatic growth, which is actually a new kind of line of inquiry these days. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things you see is actually what you mentioned, it's, it's actually a movement into a form of post-conventional spirituality, for lack of a better term, <laughs> right? So you had been a Quaker and you're on Buddhist meditation retreats and you're pulling practices from various places and traditions and having spontaneous post-conventional spiritual experience, right? Which is these dreams that were profound, prophetic and healing. Um, and so this is one, I think, lesson about th that these forms of maturity which we're asked to kind of step into by life, um, that often we, we can't create the solution for ourselves. <laughs> it, through grace, is given, basically. So it's kind of like, this is where all of the like life coaching and <laughs> kind of like human potential movement, like, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and kind of like that kind of stuff. That's all pre-tragic. That's all pre-tragic. That's all saying like, we, we don't have to actually <laughs> uh, confront the ontologic, our ontological dependence on, let's say God, right? That in fact, this is what the tragic shows us. <laughs> uh, another reason I didn't make plans for this because you make plans and God laughs, right? And so the, the sense of being able to, and this is what the tragic experience invites us into, it invites us into the overcoming of uh, the skin encapsulated ego, right? And you, you touched it like in the tragic itself, when you're, so you, you leave the pre-tragic and you enter the tragic. When you're in the tragic, uh, there's actually a, a tremendous opportunity for irresponsibility. Like this is a very complex place to be psychologically. And, um, and this is coming from, again, my work as a psychologist and I've been a uh, caregiver for many years, uh, first for my uh, mother and then now uh, for my wife. And so I've, uh, I speak from some experience about having to kind of be in the presence of profound human suffering and trying and, uh, and so yeah, the, the point here is that um, these forms of maturity were asked to move into we cannot engineer for ourselves. Uh, in, in a sense, we need to make ourselves available to receive uh, grace. And again, I'm, I'm using these terms and it's, it's hard to find other language uh, that isn't um, religious. And I would say that post-tragic consciousness is characterized by kind of a return to religiosity. Uh, and the tragic is characterized by a questioning of Prelogio, <laughs> by like, <laughs> how could you possibly be religious uh, given this, right? Given what we, given reality, which is tragically structured. That's the other thing that the pre-tragic is um, less 
epistemologically, like the, the pre-tragic is not seeing clearly what the nature of reality is. The tragic is also not seeing. It's seeing more clearly than the pre-tragic, but it's not seeing the full reality. So it's actually the post-tragic consciousness. And this relates to the owl of Minerva and the apple. The post-tragic consciousness is a kind of, uh, what should we say, a, a knowledge in the, it's like a, a dark knowledge, right? Like there's a, there's a knowing uh, that is not available when you're in the midst of tragedy and it's certainly not available in the pre-tragic. Um, but this, so this is sometimes what we call wisdom, right? Like, cause it's not the arrogant objectivistic knowing of science, right? Uh, which is often pre-tragic that we can solve it, right? The greatest example of the pre-tragic these days may actually be the company owned by Alphabet, which is Google's subsidiary, excuse me, Google's owned by Alphabet. Alphabet owns a company that is going to uh, cure death, right? So that's an example of like pre-tragic knowledge. Like there's very, very sophisticated <laughs> uh, forms of medical knowledge, um, but uh, wielding medical knowledge actually requires post-tragic consciousness, which means we're not going to do immature, ridiculous things like try to cure death. Um, and we're going to find a way to allow people to die with dignity. Um, this is what a pre-tragic use of medicine would be. It wouldn't be to deny disease and death <laughs> and pretend we can absolutely fix disease and death, but it would be actually to provide for dignified suffering. One of the things that I think characterizes our culture as a pre-tragic culture that needs to actually move through tragedy <laughs> and get to post-tragic very quickly <laughs> uh, is that we don't give dignity to uh, certain forms of suffering. We try to alleviate them immediately or explain them out of existence. Um, and so one of the things that gets kind of strange when you start using this framework of pre-tragic, tragic, post-tragic tragic, post is, <laughs> is the notion that we actually have a right in some way to be able to experience tragedy. So let me explain what this means. Like the more you love someone, the greater will be the tragedy when they die, right? The more your life matters and the more the people around you matters, and the more what you're building matters, the greater potential there is for tragedy, right? So the degree to which society stops us from kind of being equipped to be real lovers and real builders and real collaborators and real meaning makers to the degree that it turns that volume down. So everything kind of matters less. <laughs> and like love is actually dangerous because you're an atomized economic actor. And uh, there's all of these things that complicate the conditions for the possibility of actually real deep love, like the degree to that, then actually we've, we're losing out on tragedy. So this sounds odd. Like, do we want to stop all tragedy? <laughs> and I'm actually saying no, like, the deeper you go down and into life in the process of ensoulment, the deeper you go into tragedy. And so there's a, there's a reframing of the tragic actually as both a kind of, kind of like a structural property of the human existence and a sign that you're living fully, like a sign that you're taking life seriously and that you have a courage to fully love the world. Um, uh, which is another way of talking about the post-tragic because the pre-tragic only loves the stuff that looks great and lovable. <laughs> and the tragic tends to find very narrow range of things that it feels comfortable even allowing itself to love, right? Because during the tragedy, how can you love or laugh or do anything? You're in the midst of tragedy. Um, so with the post-tragic, there is that reemergence of a, the courage to love and to love extremely deeply. Um, and that's, uh, again, a risk, <laughs> right? It's a risk <laughs> because the deeper you love, like bad news is Google's project will fail. <laughs> Death will not be cured. Um, the love of your life will die. Uh, and, um, and so this is, again, these are simple things that we all know. And that's why it's, there's nothing, you know, um, uh, 
yeah, no one has a like monopoly on tragedy or suffering. Uh, and it is actually a birthright of the human condition and something we need to find a language for talking about in our culture so that we don't remain either pre-tragic, denying the tragic, or completely surrounded by tragedy and actually in an almost narcissistic spiral of victimization and uh, dramatic uh, kind of tragic complication or complicated grief, um, which is again, what you described with the frozen silence, the inability to use words to crack open the tragedy and the sense that words are actually, um, yeah, not available that could possibly help. So, so yeah, so, so I'm just kind of honored to even be in exchange with you <laughs> in, in this conversation and have this sense of a, sh a shared um, language for talking about the, the post tragic. And um, as I said briefly, and then I'll wrap, you know, this is a personal issue for many, many people, especially now, uh, given both economic and um, kind of like pandemic related issues. Uh, but more broadly speaking, as a historical epoch, this is actually the thing we're being invited to as a species. It's kind of an underlying thing that cuts across environmentalism and decolonialism and social justice and a whole bunch of other things which we're now grappling with. We're grappling with the reality of the tragedy and I've been waking up <laughs> in the midst of something uh, and uh, kind of unmasking, kind of an apocalyptic unveiling of everything that has happened. Uh, and some of the weight that we're under, I think now is that is we, how to exit the tragic. First, how to enter it in such a way that it doesn't destroy you, and then how to grapple and exit with new potentials for love and care and concern, as opposed to a hardening uh, and a perpetual cycles of traumatization and re-traumatization. Um, so it's crucial that we find a way to re, as you have, as you did, as I've explained with all the images, you did it spontaneously, you reintroduced into the culture and languages for grappling with tragedy, right? Um, we need to find ways to hug the skeleton. Uh, and, uh, you know, to know that although we may feel like a piece of abandoned driftwood on a vast meaningless ocean, that there's actually always that potential for profound recharacterization and like meaning. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so there was just so much potency in what you said. And um, uh, so I, I kind of just want to hold it there. There's, there's more I could go into in terms of the differences between the different uh, stations and the dynamics of ensoulment and things of that nature. But um, uh, I've talked about that elsewhere. So I want to kind of keep it focused on your images and the, the power of images in particular as a way through to the post tragic that what we're looking for is not answers or solutions or ways to fix it. What we're looking for is new images that we can share together um and uh so thank you and thank you everyone for listening i'm, I'm uh, like i said pretty honored uh, to be on the ticket here we're coming just to the last section now which is we just invite people to if they have any questions you want to put to zach or to marion um if you just want to raise your hand then we will ask you to unmute and uh, put your question to the group. Does anybody have any questions? I think I see Julian raising a finger there, Pippa. Oh, a, lit a literal raising work. of hand. I was looking for a yeah. Zoom hand. Thank you. Yes, great. Please, Julian, if you want to put your question. Um, could I ask a very direct question, which um, is, I just want to ask, is, is metaphor the language of the unconscious mind? That's a very 
a very direct and big question. Zach, Zach or Marion, would you like to speak to that or Jonathan even? Who'd like to take that one, Zach? Uh, it's actually a very complex question because we'd have to go, what do you mean by the unconscious? And what do you mean by metaphor and all of those kinds of things? Um, in general, I'd say, no, it's not. Um, that, uh, as I mentioned before, um, you know, my meta, my meta psychology suggests there's at least three domains. Um, there, are, and each of those domains has different unconscious processes. So there's part of, and this is, this is me extemporaneously, Hey, Hey, like I'm trying to pretend to be a fancy psychologist here. So grain of salt, but the idea would be that, yeah, there's aspects of the unconscious that are actually linguistically structured. There's aspects of the unconscious that are structured like image and archetype, in which case sometimes a metaphor does apply. Uh, and then there are aspects of the unconscious that are actually transcendent. And Freud wrote about this, uh, as did Jung, which are symbolically um, structured, which is different than being imagistically or metaphorically structured, which is different than being linguistically structured. So, so it was like drink from the fire hose. Um, so yes, some parts of the unconscious do seem to be very much uh, imagistic and metaphor-like um, in the dreams and other things. Metaphor is a good way to read it. Um, but sometimes it's different. Um, there's definitely a lot of things to suggest language is going on behind the scenes. <laughs> uh, and anyway, so, but theoretical question, um, but an important one. Thanks, Zach. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone else have a question? If you could attempt to raise your hand in Ed, Ed Haddon, I can see you. I've asked you to unmute. Hi, Pippa. Hi, everyone. Um, we had an interesting discussion about how you can, if it was an active process of moving from tragic to post-tragic, or if as I think Marin describes so beautifully and Zach called this, this process of grace or grace appearing and helping you move. And I think, Zach, I remember you mentioning being, you, you can be open to it, I guess, so rather than being closed and remaining in your frozen silence, I wonder if you could, I think we can understand how you could avoid moving from tragic to post-tragic, but I wonder if you could talk maybe a little bit more about how either of you how, you, how you see what being open means and if there's anything active in that or whether it really is a process of sort of serendipity and a journey to wisdom. Is that something you want to speak to again, Zach? Or Marion? Um, oh, brilliant. I just see it as, um, I always talk about, you know, in, in relation to forgiveness, um, you know, it's not something you can do. You can just line yourself up for it. And, and I think the lining yourself up for me was very much about um, digging, it was the shared silence, really, the, the Quaker meetings for worship of an hour of silence together and the the Buddhist retreats were very much about self-confrontation, but somehow going through those layers and just letting it through, letting it be, letting it go, something dissolving, um, made space for something, for an, in, an insight and an experience that couldn't, somehow couldn't have happened without that, um, that period of time, that safe space in, in that, at that stage in the journey and, and the trust that I felt from the teacher who, who had no judgment about anything that I'd done or written or he just, um, and, and the Buddhist teachings themselves about the, the, the interconnectedness of everything, the impermanence of everything the stripping away of the deluded self. And I think maybe that feels like the work is just really digging and peeling away what is a deluded sense of who you are. And then somehow the grace comes. That's, that's the experience. But with the wrapping of the bones, that was before all that. And that was just, again, that came from a dream. And I wondered about, Zach, that the aspect of um, Jung's collective unconscious being about images and metaphors, but also I feel I'm glad to hear about the deeper 
place of that because yes we I, I think it's what we we can't know you know the not knowing has a good aspect to it as well <clears throat> you know we're in mystery life is mystery it's <clears throat> um we can't know everything but we can trust i think that i i really began to trust that i would be given what i needed and that and again that was about anything that came into my life and whether it seemed good or bad wasn't the point it was what had come into my life and how to engage with it it was about not turning away it was about being true to what's actually arising somehow I don't know if that makes sense oh yes it makes wonderful sense Marion thank you thank you very much um we've probably got time we could probably we might just go slightly over nine so if anyone needs to go, we, we totally understand, but we'd love to get a couple more questions in if anyone has uh, anything else. I'm having to scan. Is that uh, a hand? I see a hand from Marty and then Alan, I'll come to you after that. Um, so Marty, if you wanna ask your question. I was wondering uh, either for Marion or Jack, how do you share tragedy? How do you, how does one express tragedy with um in a in a in a truthful and vulnerable in a vulnerable um way with others without being met with say pity or yeah how does one share tragedy with courage and vulnerably. Marion, or just say that for me, writing was really important. And that was the first way I, I started. And I and I knew that this was an experience that need honor needed honoring. And I had a sense that if I didn't honor it, if I didn't let be if I wasn't sort of changed in, in, in a way that was um helpful um or if i didn't allow the change if i stayed in the frozen silence i may as well be dead that was the feeling it was so strong it was like i this is it this has come up in my life you know if i don't speak if i don't find words i may as well be dead that was the feeling and i the first piece i wrote was called salvaging the sacred and it was a 10,000 word essay that was published in the guardian weekend in 1996 and and i choosing to share that was a big risk but i really trusted the editor at the time deborah or and um, we worked together and, and that do, choosing to do that changed my life because it was like opening a conversation I'd sort of made my stand with what I was prepared to share and explore and I, and I was very interested in continuing to do that and that and that happened actually and led to all sorts of adventures and experiences but especially in the prisons I think that was the most um there was something about being with people who have had on very often what you might call ruined childhoods and being able to to help them to share that in a place that where it's not often done um, not part of the culture and to see the changes and the movement and the movement from their frozen silence into it felt like you know did feel it feels as if we're cultivating circles of compassion in that work we are generating love we are being we're bearing witness to suffering in others and we're giving space for that and i think giving space to it when i wrote that piece i took a day a week and I just sat with it and and wrote down what came up and I did it for five months and then I cut it up and I shuffled it around and I found a shape and and the title came right at the end but it felt as if that's what my work is I like that description of the work salvaging the sacred that's what it feels like 
Thanks, Marion. Thank you. Exactly uh, I'll say, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like it's, it's a good question because it can be very difficult to talk about tragedy in our culture. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, Marianne was, you know, uniquely and importantly and powerfully positioned to, uh, I think, be one of the people who can address tragedy in the culture. But there are many conversations where it's like, mm, no, please, please do not bring your tragedy here. <laughs> and uh, we would prefer to actually deny your tragedy and to somehow explain to you that it's actually not a tragedy, <laughs> uh, which is uh, one of the kind of most insidious and painful aspects of, of a pre-tragic culture or a pre-tragic personality that you're confronting. Uh, New Age spirituality is a great example of this. When you show them an actual tragedy, they explain it that it was someone's karma somehow and that like it's a lesson that they need to learn in this life. Okay, that's an interesting way to avoid dealing with how the difficult situation that's right in front of you, which you're not even able to muster empathy for, <laughs> you're going to explain it away. Uh, and so there's a there's a there's a deep reluctance in some conversational context for people to enter enter the tragedy. So I'm often very very careful. Um, and uh, you know, in the case of my caregiving, my wife sustained a severe brain injury from a pharmaceutical drug. Right. So what do you do with that? Like, first of all, it's super scary because it was a pharmaceutical drug and she took it as prescribed. <laughs> and second, as soon as you say that, people think that you're an anti-vaxxer or that you don't believe in science or that you're critical of the pharmaceutical companies and et cetera, and et cetera. And they actually try to tell you that you've misunderstood the tragedy that you're in, that it couldn't possibly have been a pharmaceutical drug. Right. So there's a deep resistance in many contexts to confronting the full complexity of tragedies in other people's lives. Uh, and then there's a tendency for only certain people to get to be able to say that they're experiencing tragedy, right? Which is there's actually like a tragedy porn on social media. So we have to be careful that one of the dynamics of being stuck in the tragic is actually that. It's actually the tying the tragedy to the identity and actually uh, kind of reifying the sense of self and self-esteem in relationship to the amplification and advertisement of the tragedy. Uh, and so this social media rewards that. Um, so it's tricky, it's very tricky. But I think, like I said, in, until we find a way as a culture for, for people to, to live in a space where tragedy can be shared and discussed and my having a tragedy doesn't mean you're not allowed to have one <laughs> and uh, et cetera, like, that we can actually all lose face together um, and be in the situation of shared epistemic and ethical humility, um, which is what's necessary. Uh, so yeah, venture forth carefully if you have a true tragedy, where and when you bring it forth. Um, but it is, as, as Miriam has showed, uh, if you can find a way to do it, it's incredibly powerful and transformative to share tragedy. And it's actually one of the most important things we can do and like the point about the art, the collective unconscious, Marion is exactly right. It's a it's a it's a vast complex web of interrelated archetypes and metaphors, and many of them are specifically for dealing with tragedy, like that the human consciousness itself has adapted at an unconscious level over millennia to provide from the unconscious the things we need to deal with tragedy. Because tra guess what, tragedy has been around. <laughs> for as long as we've been around. And so we've been working on it unconsciously, collectively for millennia. So the, the, the symbols that emerge and the images that emerge from within, uh, these are gifts uh, uh, from our ancestors <laughs> about how to make sense of tragedy in symbolic and imagistic ways. And so often when, as Marion showed us, when you do find a way to discuss tragedy, you, you create this world of images that people can live inside of and then feel without feeling trapped and caught, which is what, which is why people resist the discussion of tragedy because they're afraid they can't get out again, <laughs> that they'll go down some spiral of inescapable darkness. Um, but uh, the shining skull and the hugging of the skeleton uh, and the redeeming of the driftwood um, and the owl of Minerva that flies at dusk, right? Um, so all of this is just beautiful way of, of beginning to to use language to to deal with us. So yeah, thank you, Marty. Thanks so much, Zach. Um, we're gonna draw it to a close. I'm really sorry we haven't managed to get to uh, all the questions, um, but we have gone over time. Um, thank you so much for 
for coming and I'm just going to hand over to Jonathan for some closing remarks before we part ways. Thank you, Pippa, very much. And thanks so much to our speakers, Marianne and Zach. It's really been an extraordinary uh, delight to hear you both speak. Um, I just wanted to uh, open up slightly, just to, to zoom back out from this rich experience to the, the context in which the conversation is taking place. Um, we believe the post-tragic may be a key theme or sensibility that's part of the festival we hope to put on in June. Uh, the Realization Festival. And that's an event that takes place with Perspectiva in collaboration with St. Giles House. I think Evo's just shared that in the chat box, the, the website as it is now, that is a moving feast, but you have a chance to register your interest already. And Evo maybe perhaps also just share, Perspectiva has a new website. So if you're wondering who the people are who are bringing this event to you, um, that's the best quick way of finding out online. Um, we just updated that. I wanted to just briefly say, um, when we were organizing that event, uh, we had a conversation with a person who's asked a question, Ed, if you're there. At one point, we were saying of one speaker that he was a little bit too highbrow, that actually we're not sure if we'll invite him to the festival because he's a bit highbrow. And Ed asked a very pertinent question, hmm, how, how brow are we exactly, he said. How brow do we want to be on this? In other words, you know, what does it mean? You know, where do we want the register to be? And similarly, later on, there was a question where the religious came up and the the sacred and God and these words were flying around. And again, Ed asked the important question, which was a lot of people's minds. You know, do we go there? Do we, is God in the room? Like, you know, is that okay? And I think I just want to acknowledge for everyone who, you know, may not feel that what that was um, expected or, or what they're used to or whatever, that the way we see it is that it's in the room, but it's, 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 it's not for, it's not, not assumed to be yours. It's not assumed, you know, we're, we're, we're not against that kind of language by any means, but nor are we particularly pushing it or expecting you to adhere to it. Um, and so I think when you move into the post-tragic, um, th there at least has to be an openness to these kind of other dimensions of life. Um, but there's no sense in which there's any particular agenda there. Um, and then the, the, the final thing is that uh, one time I was speaking to Zach a couple of years ago, I think, he used the expression reality avoidant culture. And I think the reason we wanna speak about the post-tragic is just not to be a reality avoidant culture. You know, it's not to necessarily encourage tragedy or, or to invite it even, but just to be closer to reality. And uh, I'm grateful to Mark Vernon for reminding me of that earlier this evening. Um, but mostly I wanna say thanks. Thanks to Pippa for hosting. Thank you all for being here. There will be further Perspectiva events um, do register interest for realization, do sign up to our website. And finally, I just want to say a great deep heartfelt thanks to the, to the owl, first of all, Marion, but also to you, Marion, for your lovely story, beautifully told. Zach, your particularly deft uh, exchange in which you moved into your own thoughts, but first of all, deeply felt Marion's and therefore allowed us to feel them all the better too. Um, and we're very grateful you could all join us.